Yes. Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker-puffed wheat yes. and Quaker-puffed rice, yes. the breakfast cereal shot from guns, yes. Yes. present the challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One king, one muskies. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Oh, what? Yes, all aboard for a breakfast treat that can't be beat. Tomorrow morning, treat yourself to the breakfast cereal shot from guns. That's the one and only Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Just pour out a bowl full, crisp and fresh, right from the big red and blue package. Add milk or cream, top with your favorite fruit, and take a luscious mouthful. Man, oh man, they're so crisp, so nut-like, and downright scrumptious, I'll bet you never tasted anything so swell. And no wonder. These giant king-size kernels of premium wheat and rice are shot from guns. Don't miss out another day on this breakfast treat. Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. During the first few months of the gold rush, the Northwest Mounted had very few men in the Yukon, and the system of border controls had not been set up. As a result, a great many undesirables managed to enter the territory. It was early in March of 98 that Inspector Conrad called Sergeant Preston into his office at Dawson. Well, sit down, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I have some bad news here. It's a letter from the Chief of Police in San Francisco. Did you ever hear of the Barbary Gang, Sergeant? No, sir. Well, they've been operating around San Francisco for some time. Smuggling, robbery, murder. But suddenly, and this was last month, all the known members of the gang disappeared. The Chief thinks they've come up here. Well, that's understandable, sir. Did they send you any descriptions? A few. Here's the letter. Read it. Oh, thank you, sir. The sergeant read the letter carefully, and then... But these men aren't the leaders of the gang. Evidently not. If they only left San Francisco a month ago, they're probably still in Skagway waiting for the breakup. I agree, sergeant. We can stop them at the border. What about the men or men that they take orders from? We don't know when they left the States. They might be in Dawson right now. Now, our job is to find out who they are. The only way it can be done is through the men the chief describes. Any suggestions, sir? Yes. First, go to White Pass and check these descriptions at the customs post. And if they haven't come through the pass? Well, Sergeant, you might try American territory. Oh. You might try Skagway. In uniform? No, as an ordinary dog puncher. You might be able to make friends with one of the men described in this letter. It's possible, sir. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to drive from here to White Pass. I'm suggesting that you try to become a member of the gang. I should be able to use a good guide. And you're out of uniform in American territory, strictly on your own. These men are ruthless. They ever found out your real identity? I understand the risk, but it sounds like a good idea to me, sir. I'd like to try it. I'll start for White Pass tonight. Good. Best of luck, Sergeant. Thank you, sir. A month later, the sergeant walked into the 303, Soapy Smith's notorious cafe in Skagway. His appearance was completely changed. He was as rough a looking specimen as there was to be found in the place. King, who stood beside him as he watched a faro game, whimpered every now and then. I don't like the place either, King, but this is business for you. There's a man sitting in the back room who's a member of the Barbary gang, one they call Spex Colmar. Colmar was sitting at a table with a girl who wore a sealskin parka. She was beautiful, ivory skin and large brown eyes. As the sergeant watched, she rose from the table and started toward the front of the cafe. 
At the edge of the dance floor, a man grabbed hold of her arm. Where are you going, Annie? Come on, King. Let go of me, Mike. Oh, why should I? You and me are going to have the next dance. I told you to let go of me. You heard the lady, mister. What's that? Let go of her arm. Well, now, look who's given orders to Mike Carey. The same Mike Carey who stayed two rounds with a great John L. Sullivan. You're drunk. You couldn't stay two rounds with a rabbit. A rabbit, you're calling me. I'm asking everybody to witness that insult. It's only his life can answer for it. The big man lunged at the sergeant. The sergeant easily evaded the blow and landed a jolting uppercut on Mike's chin. Mike staggered back a few steps, shook his head, and then quietly dropped to the floor. Did you see that? Knocked him out. His punch didn't travel more than six inches. He's got dynamite. You'd better take him outside. He can use some fresh air. Come on. Let's keep the hand, you. All right. Here we go. go. Oh, What's your name, stranger? Is Bill enough? It's enough for me. I'm Ann Gordon. I'm glad to meet you. You say that as if you mean it. Well, who wouldn't? Well, I'm glad to meet you. You know, Mike was telling the truth. He is a prize fighter, and he has fought with Sullivan. Oh, he's had too much to drink. Anybody could have done what I did. Don't kid yourself. Are you a prospector? No, just a dog puncher. What does that mean? Well, I drive a dog sled and carry freight. This is my lead dog, King. Does he bite? Not unless I tell him to. Say hello to the lady, King. <laughs> Why, he's nodding his head at me. He's just as polite as his master. I hope you weren't hurt. <laughs> Mike wouldn't dare hurt me. You interest me, Bill. I suppose you know the Yukon pretty well. A little too well, maybe. What does that mean? Oh, just that I like Skagway better. Why? Well, you're here. The Northwest Mounted isn't. I'll be seeing you, Miss Gordon. Uh, no, wait. Is there any reason why you shouldn't cross the border? Do the Northwest Mounted have anything on you? I didn't say that. Could you carry passengers instead of freight? I could carry one passenger. Are you interested in a job as a guide? A small party, three of us. Where do you want to go? Selkirk. We want to get there before the breakup. The ice won't be going out for another two weeks. There's plenty of time. But you haven't answered my question. Are you interested? How much? Five hundred dollars. It's a deal. Good. Come on back here. I want you to meet Spex. Sure. Uh, Spex and Mike will be traveling with me. Mike? The same Mike who was twisting your arm? Yes, but you won't have any more trouble with him. He's not going to thank me for what I did to him. Oh, forget it. Uh, Spex. Huh? I want you to meet Bill. Oh. Hello. Hi. Bill's going to be our guide as far as Selkirk. Oh, that's so? You've got a dog team, Bill? One. I'll need another if there are three of you. We have one. I can drive, but I don't know anything about the trail. Just, uh, what have you told Bill, Annie? That we want to get to Selkirk before the breakup. That's all. I see. But Bill's all right. I'll talk to you later. Okay. When can we start, Bill? Tomorrow morning. That's fine. Want to check over our supplies and see if we've got everything we need? Might as well. well let's go, then. All right. It was late the following afternoon when the sergeant, Ann Gordon, Spex, and Mike reached the customs house at the top of White Pass. The constable on duty gave no indication of his surprise at seeing the sergeant returning so soon from Skagway. When he addressed him, he used the name they had agreed on. Forty-mile bill, huh? That's right. I'm the guide for this party. Well, uh, papers seem to be in order. But I have a few questions to ask you. Step into the office. Questions about what? You want me to ask them here? No. All right. The office. I'll be with you folks in just a minute. All right, Bill. I recognize one of them, Sergeant. It's Bex Colmar, isn't it? Yes, the big one's Mike Carey. The girl's name's Ann Gordon. Oh, we have no descriptions on them. Still, they're members of the gang. Where are you heading? Some cabin about a mile upstream from Selkirk. They want to get there before the ice breaks up in the Yukon. Why, I don't know. Who they're going to meet, I don't know. Could be the head man. And it could be another subordinate. I believe they intend to go on to Dawson by boat. Will you be leaving them when you get to Selkirk? I don't want to, unless I have to. Spex has been sounding me out without saying too much. I've been trying to convince him that I'm the type the gang can use. You may be able to work it for me. How? Warn them against me. 
Say that I've been mixed up in a number of robberies. Huh. That's true enough. But that the Northwest Mounted Police has never been able to convict me of anything. <laughs> That's true, too. <laughs> if it works, if I'm accepted by them, I won't be able to contact the force directly until I find out what they're up to. Perhaps not even then. However, if there's anything you should know, I'll try to get word to Metka Joe in Selkirk. At the trading post? That's right. Yeah, I'll see that he's notified. Wait here while I warn your party against you. <laughs> The sergeant waited in the office while the constable talked with the girl and the two men. Then the party was allowed to continue through the pass. They made camp that night on the shores of Lake Bennett. As the sergeant fed the dogs, he could hear the other three arguing around the campfire. Then Specs rose and walked toward the sergeant. Oh, Bill. I'd like a word with you. Huh. You going to fire me? Why should I do that? The constable told you I was a suspicious character, didn't he? <laughs> yes, he did. But he also had to admit the law had nothing on you. That proves you're smart. Smart enough, I guess. How would you like to keep on working for me after we get to Selkirk? You won't need a guide from there on. If you've got a boat, you can float down the river to Dawson. This is another job I have in mind. Good pay. Maybe $10,000 and... A chance to get out of the Yukon. I can get out of the Yukon whenever I want to. With $10,000? That sounds interesting. What do I have to do? Just follow orders. That all? That's all I can tell you. I'm not the one who'll give the orders. And if I don't like them? You're in or you're out right now. 10000 Bill. I'm in. Fine. I'll tell the others. <laughs> yes, King, we're in. I wonder how easy it will be to get out. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Hey, hey, what's up? Who's on the warpath? No warpath. Me, Barry Hatchet. Hey! Well, what goes on? Me, now, Big Chief. Make celebration. Oh, I see. Congratulations are in order. And say, I have something I'd like to give you because it's just what a big chief ought to have for breakfast every morning. Must be special big for a big chief. Oh, it is. Everything about Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice is big. Take a look at the big red and blue packages. Me like colors red and blue. And did you ever see any cereal so deliciously big and crisp as Quaker puffed wheat? And Quaker puffed rice? Plenty big. You see, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are shot from guns. Big noise. Yes, those choice premium kernels of wheat and rice are exploded up to eight times normal size. Big chief like them big. And what a big eating treat, too. They're shot from guns to make them crisp and tender, bigger and better tasting. There's bang-up nut-like flavor in every big, luscious mouthful. Me want heap big bowl full now. Coming up, Big Chief. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice are ready to serve. We just top them with milk or cream and fruit and then go to it. And as all you fellas and girls know, you can always have those second and third helpings because Quaker puffed wheat and rice are so good for you. They both furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Don't miss out a single morning. For a heap big treat, eat Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Now to continue our story. The trip to Selkirk was made in less than two weeks, although during the last few days the ice on the Lewis River was soft and mushy. Spex ordered the sergeant to drive on past the little settlement around the trading post, and they finally stopped at a cabin on the banks of the Yukon itself. There, they waited for the ice to break. Hear that rumbling, Spex? Yes. The ice will be breaking up tomorrow. Aren't you going to do something about a boat? We'll have our boat as soon as the ice is out of the Macmillan. Well, that should be tomorrow, too. Then we'll leave tomorrow night. What about my dogs? We'll have to leave them here. Can't I take King with me? No. Nope. There's Louie who's bringing the boat and the four of us. No room. 
Besides, you won't be needing dogs anymore. I'd like to take King with me. He stays here. That's your first order, Bill. Whatever you say. But Sergeant Preston had no intention of leaving his team to run wild in the forest. The breakup came early the following morning. That afternoon, Louis, a swarthy French-Canadian, arrived with a large skiff. And as the boat was being loaded with supplies, the sergeant wrote a note and stuck it in King's collar. Then he led him away from the cabin along the trail to Selkirk. You're going to have to say goodbye for a while, King. I want you to go that way. Find Metka Joe. Metka Joe, King. Metka Joe, understand? That's right, Metka Joe, your old friend. He'll keep you at the trading post overnight, and then you'll leave him back here tomorrow. He'll take care of you and the team till I can come back for you. Now go on, boy. Metka Joe. King found Metka Joe, and the trader found the note attached to his collar. King, Joe does not like this. There's big chances, Sergeant Tate. But if he go to Dawson, he'll be close to headquarters. That is something. Come, King, we go to my cabin. You stay the night with me. King would have liked to return to the sergeant, and he scratched the door of Joe's cabin when the trader bolted it. <laughs> I am sorry, King, it is what the sergeant say. You take me to the cabin. We find the team tomorrow, not tonight. <laughs> the great dog settled down close to the door. But his sleep was troubled that night. And the next morning, he could hardly control his eagerness when he and Joe set out from Selkirk. As they neared the cabin where the sergeant had stayed, he raced ahead. Only the huskies, basking in the spring sunshine, greeted him. King ran down to the water's edge. King! Hey, sergeant! He's gone! We must take the dogs back to Selkirk now. This was something King couldn't understand. He knew the sergeant was gone, but why? Why had his master left him behind? He will come back and get you as soon as he can. The words were kind, but there was no reassurance for King. The sergeant hadn't ordered him to stay behind. He must find him, wherever he had gone. There was no scent to follow. Instinct took its place. King looked up into Joe's face, barked, and then started to run along the bank of the river toward the north, toward Dawson, nearly 200 miles away. King! King! It was two days later that the skiff nosed into the bank about two miles south of Dawson. The supplies were unloaded, and Louis led the way through the woods to a large clearing. Twenty men were camped there. Spex introduced the sergeant to a few of them, and then he and Anne started out for town. After they had gone, the sergeant tried to get some information from Mike. Any idea what the job is going to be, Mike? No. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Why not? We're all in this together. I don't like you. That's why not. No. I've been told to leave you alone. And that I'll do till we've finished with this business. But I haven't forgotten what you did to me down in Skagway, and I won't. We have a score to settle, you and I. If that's the way you want it. And what's more, I don't trust you. Just because I'm new? There are others here who are not new recruits. No, it's more than that. You're one of those all-fired, self-important, know-it-alls. I don't trust you. And I'll be keeping an eye on you every minute. Try to pull anything smart, and it'll give me great pleasure to break you in two. I wasn't hired to be smart. That's the boss's job. See that you remember it. Spex Colmar returned to the clearing shortly after dark. He called the men together around the campfire. Quiet down now and listen. The Northern Stars leaving Dawson for St. Michael at midnight tonight. I have tickets for all of you. We'll leave here at 11 o'clock and we'll get on board just before sailing time. Wait a minute, Spex. What's the matter? You told me I'd leave the Yukon with $10,000 in my pocket. The Northern Star will be carrying over a quarter of a million dollars in gold. Does that answer your question? How do we get it? By shutting up and following instructions. As soon as you get on board, go straight to your staterooms, and you stay there until we're underway. I'll pass the word along when we go into action. Then, Mike, yes. you and Bill head for the bridge and take care of the watch on duty. Right. Louis, you go with them. Yes. You will stay at the helm until you're relieved. Now, Mac, your crew takes Specs over the engine. continued with his instructions, and the men listened intently. 
The sergeant took advantage of their concentration to slip a pencil and paper from his pocket and write a brief note. He saw that Mike was watching him, and he slipped the note into his pocket. How could he manage to warn headquarters? There seemed to be no answer. At last, Specs finished, and the sergeant walked over to his blanket roll near the edge of the circle of light cast by the campfire. Mike was still watching him. The sergeant stretched out on the ground, his back to the fire. What to do? If we stop them before they get on board, they won't have a thing on them. Captain and the crew must be warned, and we should have at least a half dozen members of the force on board. I'll have to try and slip away. If I do, Mike will probably put a bullet in my back. Still, there's nothing else for... What's that? The sergeant heard a faint sound at the edge of the clearing. Then he saw two shining eyes, an animal of some sort. It started toward him. King, keep down, boy, down. Obediently, King crouched low and crawled up to his master. The sergeant's body shielded him from the other men. Quiet, boy. How you got here, how you found me, I'll never know. But you're always around with your needed, aren't you, fella? Now, see, boy, passing a note to your collar. The inspector came. Headquarters. <laughs> Quiet, King. Headquarters. Go on, boy. The sergeant watched King slip into the forest. Then he looked at his watch. Eight o'clock. If King delivered his message, there was plenty of time for the inspector to make his preparations. The sergeant turned and saw Specs talking with Mike. The big man was smiling. He nodded to Specs and started toward the sergeant. When he reached his side, he looked down at him, the evil smile twisting his lips. Well, got any questions about tonight? You know what you're supposed to do? I guess so. You and me are going to share a stateroom. That's so? Yes. <laughs> Here's your ticket. <laughs> What's so funny? You and me are going to stick close together from now on. Speck said so. And that makes you happy? Yes. Yes. <laughs> now, what do you think of that? <laughs> there was a crowd at the waterfront in Dawson that night. The Northern Star was the first steamer to leave for the outside after the breakup. The passengers streamed up the gangplank, and among them were Specs men. The sergeant and Mike went directly to their cabin. Twelve o'clock came. The captain gave the order to cast off, and the Northern Star steamed out into the Yukon. The sergeant and Mike waited in their cabin. Uh, that could be Specs. You stay where you are. I'll open it. Yes, Specs. You and Bill. The boss wants to see you. Come on, Bill. Follow me. All right. This way. This cabin's up toward the bow. The deck was deserted. Specs led the way forward to a cabin directly below the bridge. You first, Bill. Walk right in. The sergeant opened the door and stopped short. Facing him was a man with a gun in his hand. A man he recognized. A man he had seen many times in Dawson. A man he had known as Rex Penfield, professional gambler. Come in. Come in. You can go ahead now, Specs. Right. Come in, Mike. You heard what the boss said. Get moving. Take his gun, Mike. I've got it. Ann Gordon rose from a chair in the far corner of the cabin. Are you sure, Rex? Absolutely. I suspected as soon as you described him this afternoon. There was no mistaking him when he came aboard in spite of those clothes and that beard. Is it true, Bill? Are you a policeman? <laughs> no answer. Are you satisfied, Annie? A dirty double-crossing cop. Sure, I suspected from the first he was no good boy. But I haven't taken my eyes off him since Specs brought back the word that he was to be watched. You're sure he had no chance to communicate with anyone? I'll swear to it. Sit down, Sergeant. Relax. Sit down! That's better. We won't have long to wait now. You know, Sergeant, you Monty's have an exaggerated opinion of your own efficiency. Did you expect to stop us all by yourself? Listen. The boys have gone to work. Boss, before we put a bullet through the spell, Peen, and dump him overboard, could I take just one crack at him? 
Is it even a score for it? Stick to bullets, Mike. You haven't got a chance when it comes to fists. No chance. I'll show you. Mike stepped forward between the sergeant and Rex Penfield. Get out of the way. The sergeant dove for Mike's legs, and the force of his tackle drove the huge hulk of a man back against Penfield. In the next instant, the sergeant was on his feet, was twisting the gun from Penfield's grasp. He had the gun and started toward the door, but Ann Gordon had picked up a chair and brought it crashing down on his head. The sergeant dropped to the floor. Good work, Ann. The spalting! Deliberately, Mike Carey kicked the fallen sergeant. You don't have to waste a bullet on a Mike. Just throw him over the side. Sure, and it'll be a pleasure, boss. But as Mike bent over to pick up the sergeant, the door of the cabin burst open and came leaped at Mike. Inspector Conrad and two constables entered the cabin directly behind him. Put up your hands, Penfield. That's enough, King. Well, you seem to have got here just in time, Inspector. Get some handcuffs on them. All right. What's the meaning of this? I haven't done anything. You're under arrest, Penfield. The charge was attempted robbery. Now it's attempted murder. Robbery? Murder? And anything you say will be used against you. Every one of your men has been captured. Steam was turning around and heading back for Dawson. You're all going to jail. How did you How find out? How did we find out what you were up to? Well, this dog brought us a message from the sergeant. My men were down in the engine room and up in the captain's cabin. When you made your move, we were ready for you. Oh. Sergeant's coming too, Inspector. Good. Oh, King. How are you, Sergeant? No, oh, I'm very happy to see you, Inspector. Have you... Have they all been taken? Ah, uh, there's nothing to worry about now, Sergeant. They're all under arrest. <laughs> Stop it, King. Stop licking my face, fella. You heard what the inspector said. There's nothing to worry about now. The case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Listen, fellas and girls, tie a little string around Mother's finger tomorrow before she goes shopping. Tell her it's just a reminder to get Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Because these king-size, ready-to-eat premium grains of rice or wheat are so swell-tasting. Pour out a heaping bowl full, top with fruit and milk or cream, and man, oh man, did you ever taste anything so crisp, so tender, so downright delicious. And no wonder, they're shot from guns. Yes, actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. For the weekend, be sure and get Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Look for the famous big red and blue Quaker packages. They're never sold in bags or bulk. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case Grubstake for Vickers. When I reached the trading post in Fowlerville, I sent King to get an old man named Vickers so I could register his gold strike. I didn't know that claim jumpers had shot Vickers and that King would tangle with the crooks in a fight to the finish. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereals shot from guns. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow, because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker...